concert I was at in Boston in 1983, uh, the Violent Femmes. Uh, and I, uh, I've been slowly going uh, deaf uh, since that day. And so I think I've actually, I guess it makes sense, that I've reached, it, I'm reaching, I, I think the word is apotheosis, but I, I actually am, I think really now starting to go onto the deaf side. So, so what I've been doing is, is hearing every, the crowd really enjoying everybody, but actually not hearing what anyone was saying. And so I'm a little paranoid that, you know, maybe I'll repeat like something that they said. So if anyone, you know, talked about me, uh, you know, that, I might repeat that. Uh, I also think it, it, it's just, it's such a beautiful library here. I, I grew up in libraries. Uh, my mom's a librarian, she was a, she was in reference, and then when she started showing antisocial tendencies, they, they moved her to cataloging. Uh, <laughs> kept her out of the limelight. Uh, uh, and you want to hire a Stalinist to uh, do your cataloging. I think it's uh, just a lot of books just disappear. Uh, and, uh, it's really traumatic. I also just want to say, I was just looking at this, and it's, uh, it says nonfiction, and then I just sort of serially turned. I said, so on the other side, like, what's the opposite of nonfiction? And it's nonfiction. There's actually, either way you go is nonfiction. And uh, I think maybe that's where we've reached as a world. Uh, I don't know what that means. So I'm supposed to, this is supposed to be about, um, about masquerading, right? About masquerading. So I'm going to tell you something that happened to me. Uh, in which I was called upon to masquerade. Uh, actually to play, to act in a masquerade, okay, it was in a movie in which I was to play a character who was at a masquerade party. And um, it was, and the movie, it's, you know, it's, you wouldn't have heard of the director, Coppola, uh, Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> and uh, Coppola had decided, you know, he was gonna follow up on a lot of his really ambitious Godfather type movies, you know, Apocalypse Now, and then just do this uh, film about, um, called Jack, about, uh, it was about a boy who, like, he has a disease where he gets old, but you can't, you know, he, he gets old too fast, so he's 10, but he looks like he's 40. And he was played by, by Robin Williams. And the thing is that, what's weird is that the boy looked, I mean, exactly like Robin Williams. And, uh, and it's just weird that a 10-year-old would just look that much like Robin Williams. But uh, um, I guess it, it sort of made sense for the casting. So, I had never played anyone besides myself. Uh, and even when I play myself, I, I try to, get into character, I try to uh, do some research, I try to remember what I felt like when I was me. And, uh, and it was, you know, very traumatic. Uh, it, it's hard for me, it's, uh, but it's the leap I make for, you know, for you, the people. And uh, so I played me, but then I actually got cast in this movie, and they said, well, you got a part in Jack. I said, oh, is it like Jack? Uh, no, it's being played by Robin Williams. But, but, uh, but Robin Williams has his parents. I said, oh, so his parents No, you're, a friend of his parents, and you're at a masquerade party, and you're dressed, you're, you're to dress in a costume, and they sent me the script, and the costume was as a giant cigarette pack. And so, so like, you know, I went through a little bit of a moral, because I, I wanted them, you know, to work, I wanted the money, I wanted to play someone, not me, but I wasn't sure I wanted to play a giant cigarette pack, that I, because I, as I read the script, it seemed to be a piece of a movie that was geared towards kids, you know, towards young people, and I thought, well, if they see someone happy, who's a cigarette pack, dressed as a cigarette pack, that might give them the idea that smoking is really good and you know, really makes you happy. So I said to the casting director, can I play something else? Since I'm a guy, it doesn't seem to be intrinsic to the plot that I'm a giant cigarette pack. It really didn't seem, I doubt anyone had really given it much thought at all. I really, uh, someone had just typed it basically. And so, so I said, can I play something besides a cigarette pack? And so they asked, she said, I'm gonna ask Francis. And so then she asked Francis, then she called me back. She said, well, Francis says you can think of three alternatives to being a cigarette pack. And so, you know, and, and so now I was, the pressure was on because, you know, I felt like i would never, you know, up to that point, 10 people had seen me and now I was going to be in a movie scene by, you know, maybe 20. And, uh, there was, and it was going to affect people. It was going to affect the world, maybe affect kids. Like, what would they want to be? Would they want to grow up to be this guy that they saw that I was playing in this movie? And so it, I kind of froze, and uh, the only thing that I could come up with that I sent back was um, that I would, I would, I, I, I suggested that they have me go as, as uh, Leon Trotsky with uh, an ice pick through his head. <laughs> so then, you know, uh, I, I, I felt pretty optimistic. Uh, <laughs> Because I thought it, it's more of an angle than a cigarette pack. I mean, you, you, you're very unlikely to see Trotsky with an ice pick in his head. 
in any other movie, uh, especially geared towards children. And so, and then she, she got back to me. She said, well, I asked Francis, and I told him about, you know, just, you know, Leon Trotsky, you know. And he said, no, you have to stick with the cigarette pack. So now I was really kind of, you know, a little bit tortured, and I really wondered, should I do it? So I called, I had interviewed this guy, Wallace Shawn, Wally Shawn, who, you know, he's, he's this guy who does these really, really astringent, very moral plays. Uh, I adore him, I had interviewed him for a magazine. Uh, and he also, but he also acts in seemingly anything that offers him money. And so, and I had interviewed him, I had his number, so I left it on his phone, and then I said, you know, Wally, I don't remember, this is Josh, I'm the guy who interviewed you. And then they, they transcribed it, and they ran in the magazine with all us in it, and he said, yeah, yeah. And, and so, so I left that for him, and I said, here's the situation, I'm being asked to play cigarette pack, is it moral? Is it moral to play cigarette pack in this movie? And he called me back from, like a, uh, he said, I'm in Vermont. I picked up my, this, uh, I've never tried to do an impression of Wally Shawn. But that's why I, I dressed as a bald Jew for tonight. So it's like, I, I got your message on my machine. And I, well, and I said, yeah, so what do you think? So well, Josh, um, look, I mean, if you accept that drama is a legitimate form, which you need not, but if you accept it, then someone's got to be bad. In the drama, someone's got to be bad, and I assume if you're a man dressed as a giant cigarette pack, that you are bad. So you would be playing a bad person, you would not be evil in and of yourself, you would be portraying evil within the context of a drama. And it was around this point, I was just thinking, well, he really just takes any job. So this is incredible <laughs> that he could rationalize, I, I would like to play, you know, Naked Hitler, you know, and he, would, and he would have a thing for me. No, it works, it works, it's a moment. So, so then I sort of decided, Wally Shawn, who was pure, I mean, I was raised by communists, but he was raised by the head of the New Yorker, who was, had weird double families, and then, and then, well, he did, and then, and then he became a socialist on his own. So I'm like, I became a socialist because it was the family business. But he like, he did it on purpose. So I thought, he's real, he's real. He's friends with, you know, those people that are, are really cool and in New York, and he lives in Chelsea. I mean, things I could never do. So, so then I felt completely relaxed about playing a cigarette pack. And then, uh, so I got my cigarette pack put on me and uh, you pulled out a thing and a, a stub came out uh, and then, and I went to this party, and they were casting, they, were, they had a band that was playing, it was, they were all mommy, it was at, at Bimbo's, this big uh, club in uh, San Francisco, and they were, they, were, uh, they had, it was supposed to be a more, like da 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 whatever that is, that sort of band, da 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 you know, like that. So I was a cigarette pack, and then this woman, Helen Shoemaker, who I just met, she was playing a martini, a uh, giant martini, and the thing is, I, I said, Helen, you know, I, I just, I really don't know, I'm, I'm trying to get over the whole moral thing about playing cigarette packs. She said, don't complain to me, because I'm leaking. <laughs> they had put liquid in it, and she was leaking. Uh, she was genuinely leaking. So, uh, you know, so that really, that put it in context for me. It's like when you think, I'm hungry, but then you think about people in the world, you know? It's like, I'm a cigarette pack, but she's a leaking drink. So, uh, so then, so then, oh, so we're all set up to go, and we're all ready, and they're like, get everything set up for this really, really big scene. And then, like, there's this band that's all miming playing. They're all ready to mime. They're wearing frilly things, you know? I mean, they're a real band, but they, they're being paid to mime playing. And just before, like, the guy goes, okay, settle, speed. And then this guy from the band, like this guy, the trumpet player, he leaves, he goes, you're Josh Crumbly, right? I said, yeah. I said, yeah, man, I have seen you, you know, at the Mars and stuff like that. I said, yeah. Man, how would you sell out like that, playing a cigarette pack? <laughs> and they went, action! And I was, fuck. <laughs> fuck. I, I mean, he called me on it, and he was wearing a frilly thing. When someone wearing a frilly thing, and holding a trumpet calls you on your ethics, it, you really reach a low, you reach a new low. So then, so then I had two more scenes. I, I think I still have a little more time here. So I, I had two more, so they had one more scene, and then they added the scene. I was gonna play a scene where, okay, so where the parents, I'm, we're friends with the parents who are dressed as the wicked of, of who's, they're gonna give birth to Robin Williams. And, uh, and we're the friends and we're all at a mass grave party and then the, the mom goes into labor way too early because of the acceleration thing. Okay, so then the next scene is supposed to be at a hospital, at a hospital here in Marin somewhere, it's a like, you know, fake hospital. Well, it was an old hospital, but anyhow, so it was a hospital. And so, and then they said, right before they said, Josh, we've added another scene, the casting director said, this is fantastic. You, the cigarette pack, are gonna drive everyone else in a car to the hospital in Marin. And Josh, here's my question for you. Do you drive a stick? 
And so, so my thing was, you know, well, I, I answered honestly. I mean, my honest answer was no, I do not drive a stick. <laughs> that wasn't the full truth. I mean, it, it depends how you, I don't know. I have to talk to Donald Rumsfeld about this kind of thing, but it's like, <laughs> I don't drive at all. I mean, I'd never driven a car. So, I'm from New York City, and uh, I went to the Bronx High School of Science, which is you know, party school, and uh, they actually had a choice between putting up a mural to the great scientists and mathematicians of the world or driver's ed. And so, uh, we, we, the mural is just beautiful. And uh, so I didn't know how to drive at all, and so I said, I don't know how to drive a six. Well, you, you gotta learn, you got two weeks. And, uh, oh, and also, it's Francis's car. It's Francis's car from, I don't know if it's like a Peugeot or something. It's, it's like, so you know, even the normal way that you would do a stick would be difficult for someone because it's the European stick way of driving. And you're gonna drive like the three main actors, except for Robin Williams, you know, to this thing in the car. And you have two weeks and say, I don't drive a stick. She well, this is, you know, make it work moment. So I've been watching too much Project One Way, but she said something like that. So. So I, 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 I went to a, a driver's, I called up driver's ed, it was before the internet, pretty much. And uh, I called driver's ed, and the guy took it, and I said, I have to learn today how to drive a stick. He said, so when you're driving, you, you, how long have you been? I said, no, I don't drive at all, so I have to learn how to drive and drive a stick. And so he was telling me, like, well, there, there's, and I kept, I, mean, I realized now it's important, which one is the gas and which one is the brake. But, and that you're not supposed to use your hands, but, on the brakes. But it, it's still, <laughs> It was, and we, oh, and it was in San Francisco. So he said, okay, we're gonna go up a hill. We're gonna go up, I mean, really, it wasn't, it was like, I didn't like one of those hills in San Francisco. He said, we're gonna go up a hill. So I've never, I mean, I've seen people drive. I've seen in movies, you know, and I drove bumper cars. Uh, but I, I understand that out in the world that, the, you know, the idea is, the, the goal is different. Uh, you don't want to bump into other people. And so I started going, and the thing is, it, you know, it, it was it, it was installed, and then it would go, and then the thing is, I realized that I'm I'm distractible, and um, so I was saying, like, that's the gas station people told me about. We were the driving. I said, hey, I read about that gas station in the Chronicle. That's the gas station where they like still like clean your stuff, and as so I'm looking over, and I realized because the guy is yelling at me that I'm supposed to be driving. Wait, how much? I can't see that. How much time do I have? Okay. I, mean, I literally can't, I can't hear or see. This is like, welcome to 54. Um, so, um, okay, okay. Okay, so, 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 and so, and so I realized that, I mean, this is something that you probably take for granted because you probably drive, right? But, or many of you, some of you, someone must drive here. But you're supposed to watch the road while you're driving. For me, it didn't matter if you're in a bumper car or alternatively, if you're playing an arcade game in which like you're, you're Homer Simpson or something, this is later on. You don't have to look because nothing is gonna happen. This is actually the real world. I actually was driving, it was like one of those dreams, except I don't think everyone's ever had this dream. People have had a dream when you're naked and stuff and you're ordering a uh, soda. Uh, well, maybe not soda. I, I know for most of us, it might write sticky buns, right? But, but in any case, we've had, we've had but, but I don't think people have had the dream. This was, I was actually looking there while driving there, is what I'm trying to say. And so the, the guy was telling me about his family, the, the teacher. He started telling me about his children, that he had many children, and that they were young. And he had come here from Guatemala, and this was how he supported them. And his wife was unemployed, apparently, and, and his children depended on them, not just financially, but depended on him emotionally as well, to be alive. That the children had become, if you will, because kids are soft these days, they become accustomed to having a living father. And, uh, <laughs> What? Having seven uh, Yes, yeah, exactly. So, 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 he, so he, um, so, so, so I made it back to. Uh, he said, "Look, you have learned. I certify you." I said, "Is that official?" I said, mm, "I certify you. Get out. Get out. I can teach you no more." So then, so, so I had my learner's permit, which I got. I forgot. I got my third try. My learner's permit, and then it was like the day before. And I was really thinking, this is an ethical question, because I, I believe I'm a moral person. I believe, I believe we are all moral. I believe we are, no, I believe we are both moral and immoral. I believe, I don't believe, uh, really, I've lost belief in anything with global warming. But what I'm saying is, I was trying to decide, is it, should I, should I drive these three actors in Coppola's car, right? 
and Coppola's car, and they'd show me Coppola's car. You know, they had driven it around to the set, you know, and say, this is the car you're going to be driving. He said, isn't it cool? I don't know. A car looks like a car to me. All cars look silly to me. He said, oh, wow, there's a wheel. Oh, there's a driving wheel and some wheelie things and a fender. You know, like I'm trying to be excited about it, but I really, I'm just not excited about cars. Uh, and so, so, okay, so then I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to drive that car, and then I'm, I'm going to smash it and kill everyone. But balancing that, it's a day's work. <laughs> at Screen Actors Guild minimum. So, so I was pretty much set on going. Uh, but I was hoping for divine intervention, which is hard when you don't believe. I actually believe in God now, but not an in intervention. So uh, uh, I just believe God just lets it go. So, uh, uh, and so what happened was this. I'm almost done, I really am. I'm almost done. So what happened was this. The day before, I get a call. They say, it seems like it's going to rain tomorrow, Josh. So, I know you've been looking forward to driving Francis Coppola's car. But unfortunately, we're going to have to do this as a process shot. We're going to actually put you in the car, inside like a, a, a place, where we will film it and make believe with lights that you are driving at night. So you have to make believe that you're driving, but you won't actually be driving. And I'm sorry, Josh, if that isn't the full experience that you wanted. And I thought, wow, so like, I'm not gonna kill people. And I'll make money. That's like, that's a good day. So lastly, the last part of the story is the last thing is, the, the last scene that I was in, we had to go, um, it was in a hospital, it was in a fake, I think maybe it was decommissioned. Maybe they just made all the patients leave because Francis Coppola wanted to make a movie there. And, <laughs> get out, but I'm having a stroke. Coppola, all right, solid. Well, Godfather 3 kind of, ow, it, it hurts to think about. So, okay, so it's, I mean, I really don't know. He's a Marine guy, so maybe you guys know him better. I don't know him at all, really. I mean, he's really, so, 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 so I'm getting ready, and I'm wearing my thing, my costume, you know, stuff, and, 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 and so I go up, and there are two things I have to do. One is go through, go through the metal detector. That's the, the thing is I'm supposed to go through. All four of us wearing costumes go through the metal detector. The one who was playing... Robin Williams' dad is the Tin Man, and the joke is that it goes off. And then he has to keep taking off his stuff. I don't know where they come up with this stuff in Hollywood. So, but all I had to do was just be the cigarette pack to go through. But then I would say, hey, you can make a thing about it too. Like, no smoking. Like, no smoking. You know, it's not a cigarette pack. You know, like that. It's just, just go through. John, you're, you're a big player. Who are you? Okay, so I'll just go through. So I go through, and then there's a woman who's an extra who's playing the admissions person, and I try to go through, and she just shakes her head. She's a nurse, she goes, and I've never been in a scene with anyone else, like a dramatic scene like that. And I was offended. No, I was crushed. When people act like they're being mean to me in a movie, I think they're really being mean to me. I thought she didn't like me. And so I was just crying. I was just completely depressed and distraught. So then they said, okay, okay, Josh, we're not going to use this scene now. There's one last thing you have to do, and it's a pratfall. Do you do pratfalls? I said, well, as much as I drive, I do pratfalls, yes. <laughs> and so what I had to do is run and then trip and fall. But no one would trip me, so I had to trip myself. So Diane Lane, who is an actress in it playing Robin's mom, she showed me how to trip in case you need to do this. If you ever need to trip yourself in a movie, whether or not you dress a cigarette pack, although it helps. Do you know how to do this? You probably do. But what you do is, oh, you can't see this anyhow. What you do is you, you bang one, your toe into your heel, right? So you're running. She told you, you're running, and then you bang your toe into your heel. And what happens is that it stops. It completely stops your momentum. Well, no, your foot. It stops your foot. It totally doesn't stop your momentum. And you fall down. And so, I asked Coppola, hey, can I just do sort of like a funny little dance, like, whoa, instead of like falling? And he said, I would like you to do the pratfall. I said, wow, okay, that's, I don't have a choice. So now, action, and so I'm reading and I'm just thinking, this really could be the end of my life. I mean, this could be, or I could break things. I mean, no one has trained me in this. How did I get hired for this job? Why do they assume that a bald, fat person can trick himself? Why? Where are the patients in this real hospital? What's going on? And I'm rounded the corner, and, and I saw Diane Lane, she was dressed as the Wicked Witch of the West, and she was praying for me. 
she was praying, and I ran down the corner, and there were all these cameras on me, and then it happened so slowly in my mind. I, 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 I couldn't practice, because, you know, if I was going to die, I wanted to die, you know, on camera, on film. And I kicked my, 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 my toe into my heel, and I stopped, and I started to fall. And I swear to you, it was beautiful. <laughs> falling, falling, it felt like forever, like lost in this lacuna, this thing, this time sometimes that I dream of, this time where there's this place where there's no death, there's no suffering, there's no torture, there, 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 there's no corporate control of our country, there's no, there's no, there's no evil, there's not even mean animals who are mean to other animals, there's just niceness and total life and occasional sex, and, 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 and chicken. Okay, I just, I just thought of all the things I like. Uh, all the things, with no limit. And it was all happening, and it was never gonna end. It was never gonna end, and the cameras caught it, and I felt, and when I hit the ground, my cigarette pack cushioned me. So I just bounced gently off the floor. I bounced back up. Unlike a real cigarette patient, I bounced back up off the floor and he said, Cut! He, Coppola, said, Cut! Print it. And I knew it isn't evil to play a cigarette pack because we need drama. We need drama. And if we need drama, we need someone to play the cigarette pack. And sometimes we need that cigarette pack to drive. And sometimes we need that cigarette pack to fall. And that cigarette pack is us. And I am it. And we are all together, embraced mutually in a field of love. Thank you.